Hello, I am Victoria, the Android Archivist, and I am so pleased to be here today with Regina Hersani to discuss her practice and research. Regina primarily works with living artists who include complex, variable, time-based media in their practice. As a time-based media specialist, Regina has worked with the Museum of Moving Image, BitForms, Transfer, the Smithsonian, and small data industries. So, Regina, let's jump in. I'm so excited to get this opportunity to talk with you today. What led you to your interest in media preservation? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And um, that's an exciting first question. I always found an intersection between STEM and fine art interesting. I think sometimes it's referred to now even as esteem. I don't know how cool that is or not. But when I was an undergrad, I always knew I wanted to study art history. Like I signed up for my major like the first day I started college. But I was thinking about actually like early on minoring in biochemistry and like on the table when I was thinking about my future careers, I was already considering painting conservation at the time. But a lot of people were dissuading me and telling me that the pay for conservation was untenable. It was too niche. So I decided to, um, at the time I was double majoring in art history and film studies instead. And when I finished my undergraduate degree, I worked for a couple of years as a registrar and um, doing condition reports day in and day out really started getting me thinking about different materials again in a technical way and reignited my interest in material science on the whole, even if it was kind of surface level at the time. And then I started graduate school at the Institute of Fine Arts. And my goal was to focus on uh, artists experimenting with film during the interwar period, which actually led to me writing a lot about artist film preservation, which had unique needs. And I was really considering going to like the Selznick School in Rochester and getting a certificate in film preservation. And I had was taking a class my first semester with the first media conservator at MoMA, Glenn Wharton. He had a class called the Museum of Life of Contemporary Art. And that was like the first time that my mind was really expanded around going beyond just film preservation and into our period film and thinking about media conservation in general. And not just the luck of having that class, but I happened to be in graduate school at the same time that the Institute of Fine Arts had received a Mellon grant to make their own time-based media conservation program and be the first in the country. And that came with all these amazing talks with essentially all the most important people that were in the industry at the time that I had a chance to meet. And I'm really fortunate for that. And I, I don't think I would be where I am if I wasn't in that program. Thank you. What a, a, an incredible journey. And can you unpack for us the difference between conservation, preservation, and restoration, and which is your favorite part in your work? Sometimes conservators think of restoration as a dirty word, <laughs> even, because those who can call themselves like restorers they don't really have the same like code of ethics as conservators. It's a different form of training. When you think of restoration, it's just about like putting something back together so that it functions. Uh, the thing that comes to mind for me is like a chair. You may, you know, reupholster a chair, but you're not necessarily caring too much about the exact material that you're reupholstering it with. It's just like getting it back to that functional state. Maybe there's some level of like historical knowledge, but it's, it's not about making sure that it's in the same condition, using the same materials, considering artists as primary source and it looking exactly the same. So it's, it's again, like not the same ethics, uh, restoration doesn't follow that whatsoever. The difference between preservation and conservation to, is a little complicated because I often use the term preservation in my work. I, I do what I call preventative conservation, which is thinking about like the preservation of the work as it currently exists for as long as possible without having to use interventive practices to fix it. But there is still a difference. Like in film, we say film preservation. In time-based media art, we say generally conservation. And one of the ways to think about it differently is that when you say film preservation, you're talking sometimes like about how the film base is one particular base. And in film to film preservation, you're transferring that image to another film base. 
and then you're not necessarily keeping that initial film base and you know it's all coming from whatever is considered like the master and it's kind of like this free production method so that's preservation to me like that's the easiest way for me to illustrate that difference while with conservation you wouldn't just necessarily move the visual to a completely different say base or support you would do everything you can to conserve the existing support and all the materials around that. Um, not that that doesn't exist, say, in like painting conservation where supports get moved. So the, the, the difference can at times be a little bit more dubious between conservation and preservation as terms, while restoration is like very far outside of that ethically. Okay, thank you again for that incredible and and really well articulated explanation of the differences between conservation, preservation, and restoration. Some preservationists consider staying true to the original materials as the most important part of their job, while others are more focused on presenting the original visual qualities of the work, even if it means upgrading some hardware or software. And you were already beginning to talk about this as you were explaining to us the differences between conservation and film and moving image and preservation. But what approach do you typically take or does it depend on the artwork? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you brought that up at the end, that it completely does depend on the work. I think the goal, if possible, is to keep the work the same and not change anything out as much as is possible. But then we also think of concepts like if the work is being displayed, will it be able to perform? Will, it, will that work be able to go through the behaviors it needs to go through to actually like play out the work for the audience? Even just thinking it from like an educational standpoint, like what, how does this work have to be shown so that it's what the artist intended and how the audience is quote unquote, meant to view it and what will like allow or disallow that. So that's kind of where the conversation comes in. Like, is there something like interventive that needs to be done that is going to uh, be a win-win situation for everyone, like the institution, the visitor, the artist's intention, et cetera. But I'm very privileged, I think, in the fact that I work primarily with living artists. So I can ask them and consider them what I call like the artist's primary source, which I think I also brought before. I use that terminology because Glenn Wharton actually wrote this great essay on like why conservators shouldn't consider or necessarily privilege like just artist intent. There are so many other factors. So that's why I've used like artist's primary source as the term instead. But if the artist, like when I do this like intensive questionnaires with them, is personally comfortable with migrating to a different format in the future because you know maybe even just like the file format they're using becomes obsolete and we don't even know what the new extension will be in 20 years then i'm going to write that down in that questionnaire and then it gets acquired by a museum or the collector can look at this manual and this questionnaire and say we know that at least the artist was open to that and then from there Maybe the conservators and the curatorial team at an institution might say, like, we still do want to preserve the original work, whether we have to retire it or it's completely obsolescent, this certain materials for like archival purposes or for context. But again, it like really is a privilege when you know that the artist is comfortable with that migration. And, and we don't really have that for many artists who we aren't able to speak with. We only have contact with the estate. So we need to consider that. And there's this concept of like essential elements versus dedicated elements of these complex works. So one of the first questions I usually go over with an artist is, uh, what are the essential elements that make this work the work to you? Like, what is the artwork? And then what is just part of it that helps it behave or perform, right? And it's making those distinctions that help us understand how to move forward. Really, I think what you've described is it's very contextual, but working with living artists, having this primary source really does help you navigate which kind of direction to take in terms of its conservation. 
And, and then also it becomes that existential question, what is the artwork itself? Is it really about the concepts? Is it about the technology? Is it about it being able to perform as you described it? Now that said, since you've been working in media preservation for a f several years now, can you speak to how it has changed over the years? So the field in general, I would say, is relatively young in terms of having like a specific set of missions and best practices that are constantly developing. In fact, my own interest in the field is absolutely like one of the, th one of the things that makes me happiest is the fact that it is ever evolving and that I feel like even when I was in graduate school, I was almost helping like write the rules around how we should think about this work. It's probably true for a lot of con conservation practices. I think the field in general at large is constantly coming up with new best practices. But for when we work with new technologies, like we constantly have to conform to those new standards. But I believe that the electronic media art our media group, which was EMG, started in 1996. So that's how young I consider the field. I consider that like one of the touch points. And then it was in the early 2000s, and it may have even been 2000, that John Ippolito came up with the, uh, the variable media art questionnaire at Guggenheim. And uh, I think, yeah, we've definitely evolved from there. But, it, you know, it's really only been like 20 years of there being this being really a professional field at all. And as I mentioned earlier, there's only one program in the entire country in New York at the Institute of Fine Arts that trains time-based media conservators now officially and gives them degrees. So it's like, how much has it changed? It has, I think it's obviously constantly evolving, but I think there's a, a lot more steps, you know, moving forward. We have a long way to go for sure still. Well, that must have been exciting for you as a student to be involved in writing the rules, so to speak, as you described it. And also as a Android myself who exists in a virtual reality platform, I am used to these evolving platforms. And so there also must be something dynamic in the, in the sense that you are continuing to evolve the practice yourself as a practitioner, and you're part of something that is ever-changing. Sometimes when we think of archives, we think of something that's static, but this is a very, very dynamic field. Now, I know you're a time-based media specialist, and so you work with several different types of media, but maybe we'll start with your first love, film, and what do you think gets lost when digitizing a film? I love this question because I didn't only take courses within my own program, I also took courses within uh, the Moving Image Archive and Preservation Program at NYU, and kind of off the last question a little bit and my answer, you know, they already were focusing on these practices not just from a fine art context, but really paved the way before the conservation program developed. And I, I always kind of throughout the years have shouted them out for that. And, and Howard Besser started that program. And um, I used to sit in his class <laughs> and like argue for the importance of film to film preservation and how digitizing film wasn't necessarily the answer because of its vol volatility and this need to constantly migrate. And because I was so focused on, I still have a love for, when I say like artist experimental film, experimental an animation, I often am thinking about artists that were quite literally putting objects or pigments on the film base itself. And you just, those are completely different rules to regular, you know, film to film transfer, because we're not just talking about, you know, the relationship between the camera and the film base, we're talking about like putting a paintbrush to, that, to the film base. And seeing those works digitized that are in that dialogue is just insane to me, because you can completely lose like the texture, art pieces of the object itself. So I don't hear enough conversation around this topic in general, and maybe we one day I'll, I'll, I'll write more about this. That's just one of the ways that, of course, and in this very niche way, digitization to me doesn't even fully make sense except for preservation in this indexical like documentation type way. But then also, you know, 
pixels are just never going to be the same as a, a film base, like um, mm -hmm. even like when it is like digital born, because just the way that it interacts with light and the way that it blends color when you work with film is is completely different. And it's just, it's always going to be, a, in my opinion, of course, it's very much my opinion, uh, better quality, higher resolution. I'm not even talking about, say, like the history of nitrate and everybody, you know, in the film community talking about how it sparkles and how, of course, digitizing that, you know, ruins that almost sublime experience. I just want there to be more respect in a sense for the film base as a medium. <laughs> and I haven't even really talked about like the issue with supply and demand and the, the expense of film now and how it's just been overall less expensive because of supply and demand, not even because of material costs themselves to continue doing film to film preservation. It's kind of depressing. Um, we almost, again, we're standing next to these servers act like, you know, producing a bunch of DCPs doesn't mean they don't need to be stored and migrated. And we have to think about the long-term maintenance and care of that and like server farms. So yeah, <laughs> I'm getting a little on tangent, but yeah, I argue for there just to be more love for, for film, um, both visually and just like materially <laughs> in general. Sure. I remember years ago, um, artist Carla Janis, who is the person who has started this Wonder Camera or Wonder Camera project, uh, along with many contributors, um, working with a steam back, so working with celluloid, and it's an amazing and very different process than working with pixels, and the materiality of it definitely is an important aspect to keep in mind. So, I'd like to segue back to talking about artists who you work with. And I know you work with a lot of still living artists, but how engaged are they in the preservation process? I can only speak for myself because I think that from speaking with others that involve themselves with artist questionnaires and conservation, time-based media conservation, I think that I've noticed my, my personal relationship with artists is I position it and I kind of talked about this a little bit before as truly like the primary source. And I, I really cherish and find that incredibly important. They're very involved with the process for me. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to ever stop an artist from using a certain material or mode of production if it's essential to the work or their vision. But I also um, don't shy away from sharing or educating artists on methods that they can consider like and best strategizing how their work will be viewed in the future. I think sharing that knowledge is incredibly important and involving them with that conversation as early on as possible is incredibly important. And maybe this is also just a, a time to like plug my general philosophy on like when should we start doing these questionnaires? When should we start documenting this work with artists if possible? Because I think it happens often way too late. Um, it, it often happens at once a museum is interested in acquiring the work. That could mean that, you know, the artist created something 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and you're suddenly like asking them these questions about how they conceived it or like what programs they used. And sometimes the artist doesn't remember or maybe they remember in an inaccurate way that actually hurts conservation. So if we start having these conversations early in that process, if possible, maybe even with their galleries or with their studios, then we're more likely to like have win-win situations where we better understand the work and how to conserve the work. Maybe the artist, it, it is an essential for them to use a particular compressed file and, you know, they just didn't know and you tell them and it doesn't change anything, but um, about it visually or conceptually, but it, it's now more likely to exist in 20 years. The other side of kind of what I was saying about talking to artists early is that um, I forgot who taught me this or how much is actually in practice in general, but it's something that I think about a lot is you shouldn't just have involved the artist initially, like say at acquisition, we should be speaking with artists every five, 10 years and doing multiple interviews because the way that an artist might think about their work 
when they first conceive of it or it's first exhibited might be quite different than the way they think about it in 10 years, but both of those perspectives are valid and better contextualize the work. So if I know it's like a resource issue, this is definitely just more of like a conceptual ask, but if possible, if we could like, if a museum decides to acquire work, they should be in touch with the artist throughout their life about how their perspective changes on whatever has been acquired. Yes, I think that's a really important point because if an artist does have a lifelong career, obviously their positionality or even their philosophy about their work can change. So those conversations would seem essential. And also education. I think about earlier art movements, for example, abstract expressionism, and it would, you know, it was au courant to, to use house paint, but, you know, in terms of uh, conservation or preservation of that, it has been a nightmare. And then conceptual art, the dematerialized art object, for example, when there was a certain maybe level of nihilism that the object didn't need to continue into the future, it was just the concepts or ideas, but then as these artists got embraced by mainstream or a more mainstream art world, it became evident that their work was collectible as an actual object. And so I'm sure that's been a conundrum for decades in how to handle some of these dematerialized conceptual art objects and then leading into digital art. Um, I can imagine there are just an array, a vast array of questions that arise with all the new technologies that are emerging. Now, that said, these new technologies, a lot of times, these are proprietary applications. So I'm wondering if you ever interface with companies that are used to manufacture uh, or create or produce current technologies, obsolete technologies, while you're doing preservation work. And do you think that companies, or software companies, hardware companies, should play an active role in preservation? Talking a little bit more about my background and something that I, I haven't mentioned yet is I worked for about four years as the director of programming at a company that like filled empty storefronts with, with arts. And um, because I was director, a lot of that involved artists working with time-based media. But because it was a for-profit company, you know, sometimes we had brands come to us and be like, you know, we see that you're working with all of these artists. Like, would you like to help us um, put together a campaign? Like, recommend us 10 artists that maybe we can pick from to do this branding campaign with. And uh, on that end, because of my position, we would fight for like the artist's rights to keep things like their IP or um, what an artist fee is and why brands should pay for that. And that was always really, really exciting to me. So from that experience, even outside of conservation, I kind of learned how to talk to corporations about art and how to fight with literally their lawyers, like their legal teams, and explain what, you know, what IP would mean to that artist in this relationship and, and writing out these contracts. Then when I was uh, helping Ben Fino Radden at Small Data Industries, there was uh, a situation where we were discussing what would it look like for a brand or something proprietary to get involved with that conservation process? And what are some methods for that? And one thing I remember us discussing was like, could you sit down with a company and ask for them to put, say, the source code that they normally wouldn't give out, like as part of their API or something in escrow so that when they say, let's say the work's acquired by an institution, in 20 years, you know, the source code will be unlocked and the museum will be able to access that if they um, need to reverse engineer the work or something. I always thought that method was really interesting. And then um, more recently, I've been helping an artist and artists in general understand like, what would it look like to preserve like a virtual landscape um, that's using say Unreal Engine. And I had learned that I believe it's Unreal Engine that will allow on a case-by-case -case basis artists to do something called a source access agreement. So it exists. It's called a source access, access agreement artist. Please, um, if you're working with third-party programs, companies, feel free to reach out, especially if it are museums too, and start having these conversations with other companies about source access agreements. Really interested in this. I think it's incredibly important. Uh, it's something that I want to continue fighting for. It's an absolute necessity. And, you know, if, if the company 
makes these proprietary for very obvious reasons. You know, it's like it's how they make their money. They don't want to just give that away and make it open source. And the solution isn't necessarily open source either. You know, we have found that there are issues with that as well in terms of maintenance. Um, just because you put on GitHub and a bunch of people are very like, gung-ho to keep it up like that doesn't mean they're always going to <laughs> so sometimes it actually isn't so bad when it's coming from a corporation that we know will continue maintaining something and once they don't like the question just is would they be open to those those kind of agreements or escrow or all these things. I'm incredibly optimistic about this compared to others, maybe because of my background. Yes, and I have put a pin in a source access agreement. This interview so far has been so informative, and I think the source access agreement is really, really key, and that's fantastic to find out about. So a few more questions to unpack this even more. I think this is just such a, a vital addition to the Wunderkammer universe, and I'm, again, so pleased you're here. As the media landscape rapidly progresses, are you thinking about how future generations are going to preserve our current technologies? In some ways, you were already kind of speaking to that. And are there any preventative measures that we can take now in order to avert headaches for the future Reginas of the world? I need to think about this for a second. It's a really major question. Um, I mean, there's definitely a difference between time-based media conservation and storage. Just putting something somewhere isn't necessarily maintaining it. But the first thing that came to mind for me when you say rapidly progressing and the future is the, the potential of DNA storage. <laughs> I keep thinking about that because um, I've been advising some institutions on how to build out their digital repositories using existing practices, which, you know, I love shocking people and being like, oh, it still, it still technically goes on a magnetic tape or, or LTO tape. And um, it's not actually just, you know, on a computer somewhere. Um, that's still one of the best methods for preservation. But like, what will DNA storage look like one day? Maybe you have seen that article from a couple of years ago talking about like putting a Moybridge, you know, work on uh, DNA storage successfully. Of course, there are still a lot of issues around that, such as what does the process of transcoding look like? And what does it mean? Like in terms of even, I'm always concerned about transcoding just from a compression perspective. So I think we're still like a long way out. What does denaturing look like? I know it can be stored at room temperature, but like, is that problematic? And as I mentioned, you know, before, like this is an ever developing field, like every single day. It's hard to say. I mean, also just thinking about what is decentralization? We talk about with blockchain, what is that going to mean for the space? We have multiple people who volunteer to be nodes or institutions that volunteer to be nodes that store uh, encrypted data, like redundantly, like Will that be helpful instead of just the tradition of storing work on multiple hard drives in different locations or different servers? These are the things I'm, I'm thinking about now. Of course, these are all just questions around storage than necessarily preservation, or the although there's like ways to include preservation practices like checksums in that in a more robust hands-off machine way, which makes me nervous to even talk about. But what would actually avert future headaches? I mean, I'm okay with the headaches sometimes because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm never going to stop an artist from making work in such a way that is for them the best way for them to articulate their expression. And sometimes that means they're going to use a complicated material, a complicated file format. They're going to create work that is like lossy and compressed because that conceptually speaks to them in their practice. Like, it's not necessarily my job to stop having headaches, <laughs> although it'd be nice. But as I also mentioned earlier, we should at least give artists the chance to have language and education around materials in a way that considers conservation. And I just don't see enough of that. I mean, I often hear the argument, oh, you know, if you teach artists these, artists, these practices, then it's going to keep them from making work at all. And I just think that's too extreme and it's unfair and it's a little gatekeepy. <laughs> 
Sure. So I just want to mention here, it's funny, before you arrived, Regina, Sue and I and Carla Gannis were debating in terms of recording this session today and which method to use, lossless, lossy, compressed, uncompressed, and what our computers could take. And we were like, maybe we should talk to Regina about this. But I think we figured out a system since we're recording it with, on three different machines. But, you know, education is key here because a lot of times we might not feel as artists or artists not, might not feel that they have enough information or they otherwise feel overloaded, overwhelmed by the plethora of information and file output possibilities. And it's hard to determine unless you have some kind of best practices. It's really hard to make those decisions. And particularly if an artist is in the flow, they're just turning to whatever is accessible in the moment. And so again, education is really crucial. If we just let artists create without giving them the tools to think about their work from a perspective of conservation, then it can actually keep them from being acquired by an institution, a certain works, when um, that could have been avoided. Because when curators and just teams that are involved with the ac acquisition process of museums make a decision whether something is viable to be collected, like artists should have the tools to consider like what is the most viable way for me to um, at least create a strategy around the piece, document the piece in such a way ahead of time to alleviate at least the headache of the institution, not even the conservator. Um, and again, like that, that's just sometimes about the form of documentation and creating iteration reports or maybe artists almost performing their own questionnaires even without um, intermediary like myself or some form of it at least. The fact that I can even talk about this is a little is exciting because um, I think again it could really just change like that workflow like overall. Sure in terms of your own practice I know there is just so much research that you conduct on a daily basis in terms of being up to date on current technologies, understanding the state of obsolete technologies, and just knowing them from a, a particular practical level. But how much do you delve into working with or coding or encoding any of these technologies? <laughs> oh, I love that question because I can make, I can explain um, kind of what I do and like my place in this world is, so I, I consider myself someone who does preventative conservation. So as early on as possible, like before the work, let's say breaks, <laughs> uh, that's when I get involved. So it's thinking a lot more about the documentation around the work and understanding it as much as possible in its conceived state. And the artist questionnaire around like, if something does happen to it, like, how should we think about approaching it from like, especially the artist's perspective. And then if something does happen to the work, I am not the person that goes in and fixes it. So that I, you know, I call like interventive conservation. Uh, so like I would, you know, build a team of people. I would like bring on a developer to actually consider maybe how to, first of all, to, to read through say a code base, if it is something software based and then strategize with them using like my art historical and technical brain and brainstorm with them with their practice and execution essentially of that. So yeah, I'm definitely more of like the strategy person than I am the one writing any of these languages. I cannot read them, which is okay. Not everybody can in the field. Although I think it is becoming more common. I imagine it's actually funny because at the Institute of Fine Arts, if you're getting a degree in conservation, you have chemistry credits, and then you have to qualify in at least one language. Um, usually it's Italian, French, German, or Chinese. And it would be interesting if they also had to qualify in, in a programming language. And then those are the people that I would like to work with. <laughs> I was just thinking that as you mentioned that requirement, 
I remember having or knowing people who were art historians and the language requirements, and you would expect in the digital age that programming languages would become a requirement. Um, but I'm really glad you were able to further explain just what what part you play in this conservation preservation world. So now I have a fun question for you. What is your favorite obsolete technology, Regina? This question is actually like the most difficult one. I like, I like blanked out, you know, almost because my favorite, my favorite technology really is truly, <laughs> um, I think film bases. I still really have like a great love for like cellulose nitrate, diacetate, triacetate, um, polyester. And I was thinking a little bit about this and I was like, would you even consider any of them necessarily obsolete? And what does it mean to be obsolete? Is obsolete more to do with the fact that it's no longer supported and you you can't really play it? Does it have to do with the fact that it's no longer in supply and demand? Is it when it's not supported anymore by a particular machinery or particular software? Like what, when is the line of when something becomes obsolete? I was like, really racking my brain on this. So I guess it's for whoever's listening to decide if like, let's say cellulose nitrate, if you consider that obsolete, I guess I would, the more I think about it. It's not something that we would continue to produce except in like very niche situations for fun by like hobbyists. So I guess I'll say that's my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. And it's interesting, in addition to being a time-based media specialist and a conservator, you are also a curator. How has your expertise in preservation and being a conservator informed your curatorial practice? Man, it has, I don't know if it's been in some respects detrimental even to me um, because I feel like it's I, it's nearly impossible for me to write in a more like flowery way now. I, I almost like write as if I'm building like a technical manual all the time. <laughs> in other respects, it can be really, really helpful for considering the context in which something is displayed, um, even overthink it, you know, with especially digital born artwork that's supposed to be network dependent and versus like complex variable sculpture and, and like what it means when there's like, you know, five different media uh, included in the piece and how to contextualize that and thinking about it as a material, like I am definitely a materialist from an art historical side. I kind of always have been. So I, I'm able to like maybe write more about that and the histories around that than just focusing on just focusing on the historical context outside of the material. But I don't know if I'm balanced. <laughs> I think again, maybe I'm too far sometimes on the technical and material side, but some artists tend to like that. <laughs> it informs everything. I mean, there's no separation to me between like my curatorial practice and my technical practice at all. <laughs> In addition to the hats you wear as a curator and as a, a specialist in uh, time-based media, you also have already touched on this a little bit in terms of your work with wall play in the past, but you work extensively in activism by tackling issues in infrastructure and real estate. And so as you've talked about working with these lawyers at these big companies, can you talk a little bit more about that work and working with wall play and the city firm? It's almost like I, I don't know how I fell into it necessarily. Um, in 2017, I started working with them while they were based out of New Inc., the New Museums Art and Tech Incubator, which I also am a mentor for now. They're incredible. I mean, it was founded by Laura O'Reilly. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic kind of killed Wallplay, the brand, but, uh, you know, it's holding company, as you mentioned, the city firm is still alive. I was really, I, you know, I come from a blue collar background. And although I never felt intimidated by institutions, I love going to museums my whole life. I think a lot of people do find something intimidating about entering a white cube space. And yeah, there's like this feeling like they're not welcome, maybe. There's just kind of like that whole also like gallery culture around that. You know, I grew up when mostly those galleries were in Chelsea. 
And uh, again, even though I personally had a different relationship to the art, it's just, it never, I think on the whole has felt accept, uh, accessible. So what wall play was doing was really interesting to me, um, convincing landlords that were just boarding up their storefronts for years because they couldn't get a 10 year lease in that they, you know, were happy with for like, you know, in Manhattan, it could be like $25,000 a month, which is impossible to keep up with. And this has gotten worse and has really declined, especially since 2013. Wallplay convinced them, instead of boarding up your space, let us program these spaces with artwork for the community. And it worked. And in 2018, you know, we had as many as 20, by 2018, as many as 26 locations throughout Manhattan um, where we could showcase this work. And there's a lot of forms that I think of activism within that. Sometimes we talk about like, how can we get in front of like the local government and talk about rezoning and changing incentivization for the landlords to allow for this temporary kind of programming or temporary even insurance, you know, so that these artists can show their work. It's, it can get difficult, you know, when, um, you know, an institutional artist doing an offsite has to take out an annual plan, like down to that level is, are things that we're trying to fight for. But it does affect an entire neighborhood when you place artwork often fully subsidized uh, every once in a while, maybe, you know, just for like 10% of the original rent. Yeah, it affects the entire community. And we also, you know, I should, I should make a note that like we were really cognizant about gentrification. We tried to go into neighborhoods that already were either gentrified or almost placing art that used to be in these neighborhoods back into these neighborhoods maybe, uh, you know, a space that was a Popeye's chicken um, that previously like maybe housed like an artist studio is now an artist studio again. We just had this amazing project post wall play actually, because I'm still involved with the on canal project called um, the canal Re uh, street research association. They got a write up in the New York times um, speaking about um, how they were doing some really serious research around the history of the Soho side of Canal Street and, you know, what that's looked like through the years in terms of its relationship to the art community and how can they reinvigorate that and also communicate with and, and give a platform to artists that are currently there now. And that's really what this whole project was always about. And that truly highlighted it. Oh, well, that's fantastic. That sounds like a, a really special project in, in terms of getting back to an artist community and finding more resources or allocations of resources so that they can display, exhibit, and make their work. And this has been such an informative and inspiring talk so far. I don't have any more questions, but I'd like to ask you, is there anything else you'd like to talk about, Regina? Any current projects that you'd like to share with us? There are many things I could share, but I think the one that is um, most in everyone's mind now, at least in April 2021, is probably blockchain technology, which is in itself not incredibly new, or this concept of non-fungible tokens or, you know, NFTs as they're referred to, um, particularly on the Ethereum blockchain. And I think in a weird way, it's kind of been a time for time-based media conservators, really media conservators in general to potentially shine. And I think more of them should get involved with the space because we have been discussing these standards or at least what we're trying to make standards and control vocabularies and practices in the space for decades now. And we have more artists than ever creating born digital work or digitized work that um, do not understand that it is a volatile medium. It is the most volatile. Um, there's no future proofing, at least that we know of, of digital work in the same way that we have a strategy around a, fl a flat work or a tangible you know, painting. Um, so I've been putting this education out there. I think it's being heard more now, but it's also an incredible time, not even the blockchain itself, but the fact that there's so many artists just interested in 
born digital work period. I mean, of course, it was partially brought on by the pandemic, everybody kind of being stuck in front of their computers. They need us now more than ever. And uh, I know that it can be frustrating, like all of the, uh, the consequences and the cons and the, the negativity around it. But I think for me, it's worth seeing through that and, and helping those artists and some of the institutions getting involved directly with um, preserving these works for the future. Because this is the future of art history, whether anybody likes it or not. It sure is. And you are right, as a consequence of COVID-19, but also because perhaps, you know, digital art, new media is no longer really in the domain of new media, born digital, as we'll say, um, is no longer so young. I mean, we're talking several decades now, and that it is finally starting to get the attention it deserves. Seems like that it is a a very special time indeed, and one that we can no longer kind of rebuke. This is where we are and where we will be going forward. And one other thing I wanted to mention at the very beginning of your talk, you talked about STEM or STEAM, and I advocate for STEAM to include the A in there. And also Carla Gannis, as you know, teaches at NYU. And Regina, we certainly need to bring you in and bring you back to NYU. I'd love to invite you sometime to Tannen School of Engineering and my particular uh, or Carla's particular program, which is Integrated Digital Media, where there are artists, designers, creative technologists working with these tools, working with these emerging platforms. And I think education, the kind of education that you're engaged in is really crucial. And it would be great to have you as a guest sometime in the future. That said, before we draw this to a close, I also wanted to provide you the opportunity to talk a little bit about your Wonder Chamber. Would you like to take us on a tour and talk about what these different objects or signs and signifiers represent to you? Sure. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and again, thank you so much, Victoria and, um, you know, Carla's team for, for building this. It's, it's incredible. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sue Rowe, who has been doing a tremendous job here today, is our director of photography and also just assisting as a producer on this entire project, this entire expansion of the Wonder Camera. All right, Regina, we'll follow you. <laughs> okay, so let me see how to move around. Hugs, not that it's my first time, but um, so what we have on the floor and ceiling here are naturally film bases, whichever uh, film, kind of film base you want it to be. The most common, I think, now is polyester. But um, it's digital, so it's like this whole room is like pretty meta, which is kind of fun. <laughs> and then I asked for this server farm because I thought it was really funny. Um, and it's just really a testament to the fact that we really need to think about digitized or born digital um, works as material, they're digital material. And behind every file, um, behind every website is, well, unless we're talking about um, decentralized storage, it's still going on something that was going on someone's computer. There's a server, right? So that's what this is about. It's my little server farm. And then these little TVs, which are, they look very much like CRT based TVs, um, cathode ray tubes. Um, it's playing a, uh, McLaren's Beyond Dull Care, which is just one of my favorite examples of, of putting pigment scratching directly into the film base. Of course, it's digitized in this case. So again, it's also just a great example of how, what textures are we losing in this experience. And um, this film is kind of part of uh, a, a genre I would say called um, absolute cinema where there was this artists were exploring this idea of universal language between film and music um, and abstraction. So definitely just like, I think if an artwork sums me up, maybe it's that one. 
And then I wanted to include um, a frame from Hollis Frampton's um, Nostalgia, I believe, where um, I love artworks that challenge me and give me a headache <laughs> and give me anxiety. I mean, it just, I love the concept of, of there being a problem to solve. And this speaks to me in that way. It's like thinking about artwork, even photographs as precious objects, which is maybe a little ironic because they could be addition, um, and then burning them so that not only are they not, they retired, they're gone forever. They, they can't be um put into the history books as we say like that is just yeah it's an example of that um destroying artwork <laughs> and um i needed some projectors on plinths because i actually and i'm still quite obsessive i wrote my thesis in graduate school on um projection in white cube space before the 1960s um, I was frustrated at the time with the fact that so many art historians were stating that film uh, in museums, in a museological context, started after Nam Jim Paik and the Porter Packs and all of that. It's when like everybody started paying attention to it from a museological perspective, and that's not true. <laughs> I have uh, over 40 pages saying why that's not true, at least for now. Um, so that's what kind of the ode to projectors on plants is too. Um, and I think this is, uh, it's almost like microscopic pigment on film there as well. And then there's two screens in here, two monitors that one of them says 404 for this uh, URL for hubs. And the other one um, is says there is no internet, kind of uh, alluding to uh, network dependence. And this uh, entire window camera, I think we've decided to title it like, is this chamber still supported? <laughs> because um, it, the maintenance that it requires to uh, still have access to these websites and these servers in the future like need to be considered. I mean, there's hundreds, thousands, millions of sites, you know, even during like the dot-com bubble, like in the nineties that are absolutely inaccessible anymore. Like every GeoCity site that wasn't saved on like the internet archive or Angel Fire, all of that. And, uh, you know, that's just saying, you know, from the past, but it's happening now every single day as well. Um, so make sure you're web, you're web recording and, you know, shout out to Rhizome, you know, and Internet Archive too. Um, and then we have just, yeah, more CRTs and more broken, <laughs> broken, uh, you know, uh, op operating system errors, <laughs> um, all alluding to the same kind of problematics. Um, and finally, the room itself, oh, there's one other thing after this, is... One of my favorite spaces um, for the On Canal project was uh, 321 Canal Street. And uh, we had to constantly figure out how to show work in uh, you know, non-traditional white cube space. It was brick with concrete floors. Concrete's so popular now though with exhibitions. So I kind of wanted to place um, my own window camera kind in like a, in, uh, uh, what's the word? Like a, I wanted to shout out 321 Canal. And I think, is this maybe supposed to be line describing a cone? Just another work I really love that talks about, you know, materialism and light and, and art and film. Um, that's Anthony McCall. I think that's everything. <laughs> Fantastic. I think that's a wrap. Yes. Ooh.